you're here. I, you know, we all bring our needs, don't we? We all bring our baggage and our needs and our problems, and we bring them to God. And we're glad that he's here to hear us. The goal of this church is to get you to heaven. That's it. Our goal is not to build walls. Our goal is not to build barriers. Our goal is not to run everybody's life. Our goal is to get each other to heaven. And to, to do that, we have to talk about the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus. And every now and then, some things about how God expects us to live in certain ways. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning with the Lord's help. Join me in our confession of faith together. I'm a child of God. I am saved by grace. I live each day by faith. And I'm ready to hear God's word. Now, the passage we're going to study, if you'll stand for the reading of the word, the passage we're going to look at is from Romans 12. It illustrates 1 Samuel 24, which is what we're going to study, the story of David. Paul says to us as Christians, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. May God bless this message and his people said, Amen. Let's dismiss our kids for their lesson. I want to talk with you this morning. We're, we're studying through, we're, we're taking stories from the life of King David. David is called a man after God's own heart. And yet he doesn't always act like that, does he? Sometimes he, sometimes he goes over to the dark side for a little while and then has to be brought back. The beauty of David is David knows where home is, and he somehow always finds his way back to God. Today we're going to look at a story where David actually acts like a man after God's own heart. His, his behavior to me is stunning. His behavior to me is not something I would be thinking about doing under the circumstances. So today is one of those illustrations where, you know, his life is a, is a, a life of praise and not passion. He's not giving in to his human instincts. He's doing what in his heart he knows God wants him to do. That's remarkable. And that should be the goal for each of us, shouldn't it? is to try to be that person that in the worst possible temptation circumstance, we say to ourselves, ah, oh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going there. I know that's not any good. Great, great passage to study. Let's set the stage. Now, you know that David and Saul, King Saul, are not getting along well. David slayed, David slayed Goliath. And Saul should have been appreciative because it gave his armies the victory until the women started lining the streets and singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Well, that's a little bit galling to the king. He doesn't like that kind of talk because it makes him look, you know, his ego's getting bruised a little bit. So all of a sudden he starts devolving mentally into a very suspicious paranoid, mean-spirited person. He brings David into the royal palace. He, he hires David, so to speak, to stay and play soothing music for him during these times of craziness in his life. And it helps. But every time Saul sits on his throne and looks over at David, he sees the man who killed Goliath. He sees the man who slays his ten thousands. Now what's funny is this. Even though Saul resents what David did, Saul puts him in charge of part of the army. Why? Because the guy's good at what he does. So Saul, David is commanding part of the army, and yet Saul hates him 
because he's got such stature among the people. Finally, Saul decides one day he just can't stand anymore. He picks up a spear and he throws it at David and tries to kill him. This happens repeatedly. We've noticed two or three passages in earlier lessons where Saul just every now and then he just he just goes crazy and he just grabs a sword or anything else at hand and just flings it at David to the point that David finally flees for his life. In fact, David flees the capital city. In fact, David flees the kingdom of Israel. He runs and he runs and he runs. David takes away his, the support of his wife. David takes away the support of his best friend. David, or God takes away his wife. God takes away his best friend. God takes away the support of his prophetic friend, Samuel. God takes away his position of influence. David is left with nothing. David goes down to the land of the hated Philistines, the people whose hero he killed. And he seeks refuge there. Well, they're not going to have him there. You talk about bad karma, that's just not good stuff. And so to save his life, he fakes being insane. He drools on himself and scratches on doors and acts like he's crazy until he finally gets away from there. As soon as he crosses the border, here comes Saul. More troops, more troops. Saul has now put a, 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 a price on his head. They've got wanted posters all over, all over the kingdom, not for Billy the Kid, but for David the conqueror and and Saul's just Saul's just obsessed with hunting him down and killing him to the point that Saul takes all of his armed forces and brings them inside the country and and you know basically he uh, he turns them into a private police force and they, they're chasing David everywhere David's running from cave to cave from corner to corner and rock to rock down in the hills of southern Palestine just trying to stay alive now, I want you to think about this. All of us know how it feels to be mistreated. Amen? Yeah. I mean, is there anybody in this room that's not been mistreated? You wouldn't raise your hand if you hadn't been. But we all have been, haven't we? We've all been mistreated. We've all had people say stuff to us that's ugly. Do things to us. You ever been, you ever been bushwhacked behind your back? You ever had somebody you know, undermine you to another person or spread gossip about you or maybe you've had somebody actually harm you, actually assault you, verbally or physically. We've all been mistreated. And I'll tell you, the older you get, the more you've been mistreated because we live in a world where sin dominates and so sinful behavior dominates. And, you know, the minute you start interacting with other people, you're going to get stepped on by somebody. Because most people are out for themselves. And that means that to get where they're going to go, they've got to walk on top of you to get there. How many of us have had that boss or that coworker, that obnoxious, stinking, lousy, no good jerk that makes your life miserable? And enjoys every minute of it. And when you complain, they support him or her. Hey, mistreatment's a fact of life. And because of that, we also all know what it feels like to want revenge. Have you ever laid in bed at night thinking of ways to do ugly stuff to somebody? Have you ever laid in bed at night going over a checklist? Well, I could kill them this way. I could kill them that way. And then once you get the list of ways to kill them, you start ranking them as to what's the most hideous, disgusting, loathsome, painful, horrible way to kill them. And you say, now, how can I refine this and make it really, really, really good? Have any of you ever sat and thought about how to get even? How to get some payback? Hey, if you haven't, you're not normal. I'm sorry. We've all done it. We've all done it, and to be honest with you, we all still do it. It is part of the fallen sinful nature within us that we seek revenge. 
because nobody likes to be stepped on and nobody likes to be used and nobody likes to be mistreated and our sense of justice our sense of righteous justice says if somebody does me wrong they ought to be made to pay for it and you know something I'm gonna tell you a little secret God agrees with you now be careful where you go with that vengeance is mine I will repay them says the Lord does God agree that mistreatment deserves punishment? Sure he does. He just doesn't put you in charge of it. And it's probably a good thing he doesn't. Right? That's a whole different thing. That's what we're going to look at real quick. I entitled this section, The Drama Continues. Everything around Saul is drama. Now, I know we all see drama every now and then, but nothing like what goes on in this place. This guy is certifiably nutso. I mean, he's, he's crazy. The Bible says that God sent a troubling spirit to him, and the longer the spirit stayed, the nuttier he got. He's paranoid. He doesn't trust anybody. doesn't trust his own son. doesn't trust his family. doesn't trust his soldiers. doesn't trust his generals. doesn't trust David. doesn't really, when you get right down to it, he doesn't trust God. Because when the, when the time comes to get help with a situation where he needed divine guidance, what does he do? Later on, he turns to a witch, a spiritualist medium, to conjure up some spirit from the dead to give him advice. Why? Because he doesn't trust God. Or maybe he doesn't like what God tells him. You know, sometimes we don't trust God because we don't like the advice God gives us. If you don't agree with God, then you quit trusting him. Well, I'll go to somebody else. The drama continues. Saul continues to pursue David this goes on for years you talk you know you see these shows on TV about these FBI manhunts where they go on and on and on and on every time they get a lead they'll run out there and see if they can catch the guy this is what goes on with David and David's a pretty well-known person he's pretty pretty recognizable now because he's fairly famous so sooner or later no matter where the guy goes word gets back to Saul hey he's here hey he's there hey I hear he's staying in the caves down in that valley and here comes Saul and the Keystone cops running after him, coming to get David. And what he doesn't realize is the reason he can never catch David is because God is always protecting David. God's not going to let Saul get him. Saul doesn't get that. Listen to what it says. A couple of passages here in, in 1 Samuel 23. Saul learned that David was at Calah. Good, he said, and we've got him now. God's handed him over. To, God's not going to hand him over. He's trapped himself in a walled town, so Saul mobilized, look at this, the entire army. What about the borders? Forget the borders. i got to get David. This is obsession. He's crazy. We've got him. Take the entire army. March to Caleb, besieged David and his men. David and his men, about 600 of them, left Caleb, began roaming the countryside. Word soon reached Saul that David had escaped. So he didn't go to Cala after all. David now stayed in the strongholds in the wilderness, the hill country of Ziv. Saul hunted him day after day. But God didn't let Saul find him. This guy's relentless. I mean, he's like a bad dream. Except he's walking on two legs and following you around with an army of 20,000 men. Well, when he starts getting close to where David is, God prepares a distraction, a diversion. All of a sudden, the Philistines cross the southeast border of Israel. Now, Philistines are nasty people, and you've got to defend your borders, right? So just when Saul thinks he's got David by the tail, he's going to fix him up good and get rid of him and kill him, the Philistines invade. And all of a sudden, word comes to, to Saul, oh my, we've been invaded on the southern border. And Saul says, well, I hate it, but we've got to go run them off. Okay, get the troops together. And they all take off over toward the border with the Philistines. David flees even further inland. He ends up at a place called En Gedi, E-N-G-E-D-I. It's an oasis on the shores of the Dead Sea. It is the most desolate, forsaken place you'll ever want to see. If any of you have seen Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls are, where you've just got the hill out in the middle of the desert, okay, En Gedi is just about 12 miles south of there. It is a nice oasis. There's water. There's some caravan routes that go through there. 
But there's also hills all over the countryside there. In fact, in addition to the Dead Sea Scrolls, a number of scrolls have been found in those hills above in Gedi. Every time there's a rebellion and it kind of falls apart, everybody runs down to En Gedi and hides. So David ends up in these caves, living in this absolute remote oasis on the, on the far, far southern border of Saul's kingdom. He's getting just as far away as he can. He's hiding down there, these big, deep ravines with caves. Some of the caves, and they've been inhabited, some of the caves, the archaeologists, to get to them, had to climb rock walls 200 feet high to get into the caves. Good place to hide. So David's up there. Here's what it says. Saul and David were now on opposite sides of a mountain. Just as Saul and his men began to close in on David and his men, an urgent message reached Saul that the Philistines were raiding Israel. So Saul quit chasing David, returned to fight the Philistines. Ever since that time, the place where David was encamped has been called the Rock of Escape. That's a good name for it. And David went to live in the strongholds of En Gedi. So David's down in En Gedi, hiding away. Saul's over here fighting. Now, as soon as he runs the Philistines home, what's Saul going to do? I give you three guesses. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to go right over to En Gedi. He's going to run over there as fast as he can get there because he's got this obsession with killing. He thinks David is a threat. Is David a threat? No. God's the threat because God has already said, you're out. But as David understands, God will pick the time and the place for the payback, not David. Saul and his troops soon returned, and that's where we open chapter 24. Saul returned from fighting the Philistines. He was told David had gone to the wilderness of En Gedi, so he chose 3,000 elite troops. These are his Navy SEALs. These are his Army Rangers. He picks his best 3,000, and I'll tell you why. This is not an area down in En Gedi where you take a whole army. You can't provision them. There's no water for him or anything. So you take your elite troops. He's going to go into this difficult terrain. He's going to take his elite troops. They're going to march in. They're going to extract this problem guy. They're going to do him in, and they're going to pull out. This is a, this is a, a seek and destroy mission. So in search of David and his men, they went into what is near what is called the rocks of the wild goats. Does this tell you anything about the terrain? The rocks of the wild goats. Eh. You ever seen those mountain goats in the west that get up on the mountain sides and you wonder how in the world they even stand up? Well, that's what En Gedi is like. <laughs> so there you go. Now, what follows is one of the strangest encounters in the Bible. It is strange in that, for one thing, it's kind of embarrassing. And number two, it's an amazing story of self-restraint, of somebody truly trusting God. Saul enters the cave. David is hiding in the back of a cave, and Saul enters the cave. Doesn't know David is in there. David and a handful of his select men are in the back of the cave. Saul goes into the cave. Why? He's got to go to the bathroom. Somebody says, you mean that's in the Bible? Yeah, it's in the Bible. Look at this. At the place where the road passes some sheepfold, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. Do we know what that means? <coughs> We're not talking about running behind a bush. We're talking about the other kind of, you know. And it's key to the story, as, as, as insensitive as it sounds. And by the way, the Bible is not nearly in, as insensitive about normal functions as we are in our culture but it's the key to the story because when you're in a cave doing that you are totally helpless you have removed your outer armor and royal robe you have put down your weapons and you are standing or you are squatting back in a dark corner I mean you know I'm not going to try to gross you out, but imagine the picture. It's, it's undignified. This is the king. It's undignified, but it's also 
unbelievably vulnerable. 20 feet away crouches David, fully armed with, now remember our story from last week, with the sword of Goliath in his hand. Mm, man, aren't you just licking your lips? You're thinking, oh, this is sweet. You ever have a chance to get revenge on somebody and the situation just opened up perfect for you to get exactly what you wanted against them? And you think to yourself, God has heard my prayers. He has laid this sucker in my lap. I'm going to own him. Man, what a break. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Boy, this, this, is, this is in spades right here. David was hiding, but as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. And I like the writer, that, the translator that puts the exclamation point at the end. Kind of makes the point, doesn't it? So David's men look at him and they say, kill him. Come on. What are you waiting for? God, now listen to what they're going to say. They're going to say, God has laid him out on a slab for you. He's yours. I mean, is this not a sign from God? You know you're going to be the king. God's already told you that. In fact, God's already anointed you the next king. He's already announced through your prophet friend Samuel that he's going to get rid of this jerk. Why not get rid of him now? Think of how much our lives would improve if we just got rid of this guy. We could all relax a little bit. And in the heat of the moment, what a great idea. Now's your opportunity, the men whispered to him. Today the Lord is, uh, by the way, when you want to do what's wrong and you can get God to justify it and sign off on it, it really makes it great because then you can sin and not feel so bad about it. Well, God signed off on it, you know. God doesn't sign off on sin. Ever. Anywhere. Anytime. He just doesn't do that. God's telling you. I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David gets bold and he creeps up and he cuts the corner off. He cuts part of the hem off Saul's robe. What? Well, I'll teach him. I'll cut the corner off his dress. <laughs> That'll really put him in his place. Well, there's a purpose to that. Now, like I said, the robe is off, right? So it's laying to the side. David doesn't have to come up and bump the guy. He eases up and he pulls back a part of the royal robe and he slices a piece off the bottom of it where the hem is. And then he quietly recedes back in and Saul never has a clue as to what's happened. Now, the minute David does this, it tells me David's heart is right. It doesn't say he snuck up and gouged the guy in the gut with a sword. He slices off a piece of the royal robe. And there's a reason. David has a plan. Because David refuses to play God. Quit trying to play God. We all need to do that. I'm not God. It's not my job to take care of business. We have whole churches that believe it's their job to pass judgment on everybody. That's God's work. That's not my job. God didn't send me to pass judgment. God sent me to sow seed. Isn't that what Jesus said? Go into all the world and condemn everybody you meet and tell them they're going to hell. That's not what the Bible says. Go into the world and preach the good news to all men. Most people already know they're sinners. You don't have to make a case. What they want to know is how to not be sinners. How to get it right. How to, how to have fellowship with God. So that's what we're here to do. And David understands that. It's not David's job to punish Saul. God is the punisher. It's his job. And he'll do it when he's ready. And he'll do it in the way he chooses to do it. And praise be to God. That way nobody has to take the blame for it. Okay, if Saul walks out and the mountainside falls on him, hey, that's the way it goes. Whose fault is that? What do we call that, by the way? An act of, <laughs> how about that? We call it an act of God, yeah, because God is the one that settles those scores. Look at this. 
David's conscience began bothering. Now listen to this. This shows you how really decent this guy is. It starts bugging him that he cut this piece off the robe. It's like, I don't see the problem here. It bothers his conscience that he cut the piece off the robe. And he says to his men, God forbid that I should embarrass the king like this. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one. Who made Saul king, by the way? Now, come on. Who made Saul king? God did. Who said he was going to remove Saul as king? God did. So who has the privilege to remove him? God does. He made him. He's condemned him. He'll judge him. Boy, that's a lesson we still need to learn, isn't it? We still need to learn that lesson. So he says, I, I'm not going to mess with God's chosen one. He's God's man until God's done with him, and then God can get rid of him. And David restrained his men. They said, look, if you won't do it, we'll do it. No, you won't. No, you won't. I'll stand right here in front of you and not let you do it. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. This is real integrity. This is real strength of character on display here. He not only refuses to do wrong, he could let one of his men do it and then look at God and say, hey, don't we do this? We'll just get somebody else to do it. We'll tell our cousin, let them spread the rumor. Well, it wasn't me to start. It wasn't me to spread the rumor. It was her. It's him. Murder by proxy. By the way, David does that later. He does the very thing later that he refuses to allow to happen here. Shows you how time and life can wear you down sometimes. He confronts Saul and declares his loyalty. I love this. So Saul climbs down out of these caves, feeling a little bit lighter. <laughs> he ruffles his skirts and gets himself, you know, presentable again. And then David pops out of the cave. When Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king! Yo! What's up? The king turns around and looks up, and there's David standing there at the mouth of the very cave that he'd been squatting in. I mean, the irony here just seeps out of the words. David's standing here, and he shouts at him, and, and Saul looked around, and David bows. It's not a cocky bow. It's not like, thank you very much, stupid. It is a bow. What, it, what does it say? He bowed low before him. This is what you do to show respect for a king, isn't it? You, bow, you know, you've seen in the movies where they bow in the presence of the king. He, he bows to one knee as a sign of Respect for the king. And then he shouts to Saul, Why do you listen to the people that tell you I'm trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your own eyes it isn't true. The Lord placed you at my mercy in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said I will never harm the king. He's the Lord's anointed one. And look, my father, I even have in my hand a piece of the hem of your robe, just so that you'll know that I was close enough to slit your throat. This proves, and it does, that I'm not trying to harm you and that I've not sinned against you even though you've been hunting for me to kill me. He says, "May the he says, and, and notice who he puts in the middle of this, may the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you're trying to do to me, and I'll never, but I'll never harm you. As the old proverb says, from evil people come evil deeds. You can't get good results by doing bad things. I've heard in recent, in recent days, I've heard comments made, well, that doesn't matter because we won. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's not Christian. Winning has nothing to do with it. Well, it's anything we do is okay as long as we win. No, uh-uh. Doesn't work that way. Should he spend his time chasing one who's as worthless as a dead dog or a single flea? May the Lord therefore judge which of us is right. Who's he putting this on? Who's he handing this over to? He says, it's God's business. Why don't you quit trying to judge what you should do with me, and I'll quit judging what I should do with you. Let's just let God settle this out. If God wants me to be king, he'll make me king. 
If he wants you gone, he'll make you gone. If he wants you to stay as king, you'll stay as king until God takes you out. I'm going to put it in God's hands and trust God to do the right thing because God is the only one in all the universe who truly knows all the facts in a situation and is truly just in everything that he does. We judge people in their situations all the time. Well, I know, I know this and that. And, uh, you know, uh, in marriage, people talk about guilty people and innocent people. People don't know what they're talking about. We don't know what we're talking about. We're just making judgments. Let's let God sort that stuff out. It's not our business. It's not our job. You know. Well, temporarily. I should have put the word temporarily in here. Temporarily, David's good actions causes Saul to repent. Now, Saul's nuts, okay? Saul is literally insane. So when he says, I forgive you, I'm so sorry, it won't ever happen again, the only time Saul lies is when his lips are moving. Okay? I mean, you're not going to move back in with him that afternoon and be his buddy. When David had finished speaking, Saul said, Is that really you, my son David? <laughs> I love you so much. You're my buddy. And then he began to cry. Now, that is a sign that he has been touched by what's happened. He says to David, You're a better man than I. Boy, that's the truth. For you have repaid me good for evil. That's biblical. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today, for when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. And who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well, he will, for the kindness you have shown me today. And now I realize that you are surely going to be king, and he will, and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule, and it does. Saul is a little bit prophetic here, even though he doesn't realize it. He's just trying to kind of be kind to David and express his shocking and gratitude for what happened. Let me give you three very powerful thoughts here. This story just speaks worlds to our life. Number one, people are sinners, so expect mistreatment. Did you catch that? People are sinners. So you're going to get walked on. You're going to get lied to. You're going to get cheated. You're going to get talked about. You're going to get made fun of and bullied and all kinds of other stuff. You're going to be lied to. You're going to be betrayed. You're going to be hurt. Why? Because most people in the world are sinners, and sinners act in sinful ways, and it's just going to happen. That's why it was easy to say at the beginning how many of you have been mistreated, and everybody raised their hand. Welcome to the world. Let me give you the second thought, though. You are a sinner, too. No, I'm a Christian. You're a sinner. The first thing they tell you in Alcoholics Anonymous is, once you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic. Right? From then on. You may be an alcoholic that no longer drinks, God bless you for that. But the minute you start thinking of yourself as not an alcoholic, you'll start drinking again. Well, guess what? As soon as you convince yourself you're not really a sinner, you'll be right back in that stuff. You're only sinless because Jesus has washed you of your sins, and thank God for that. But that old man of rebellion is still there inside you. And you know that because the last time somebody insulted you, which was probably yesterday afternoon, you got that burning feeling inside and you wanted to put your fist right in their face. That's old sinner coming out. He's always around. He's never far away, is he? She's never far away. They're right there. Yeah. And so... You know, the other thing is you can always expect to be mistreated. You can always expect those feelings of revenge. And it's okay, by the way. And, and Marty and I joke about this all the time. Of course, being a counselor, you've heard this from counselors. Feelings aren't good or bad. Feelings are just there. Feel, there's nothing wrong with a feeling, even, even a nasty, mean feeling. It's okay. Feelings, there's nothing wrong with feelings. 
you can't always act on those feelings. But feelings are just feelings. And when somebody mistreats me, I want to get even. Don't you? I want a little payback. And so I'll look at God and I'll say, God, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to turn it over to you, but please take him out quick. I mean, put a good whacking on this guy. He needs it. And you know that. You know more about him than I do. And I know so bad, much bad stuff. I know enough to do him in. Try to get this thing done, and God may never touch that person in their entire life. But time will come when God will repay. And by the way, if you walk against the will of God, you'll get repaid too. See, that's what you got to remember. God's fair to everybody. He's an equal opportunity blesser and curser. So God is just. God's the only one that will give you a fair decision every single time. But I was in the right, God. If you were truly in the right, God knows it. Well, that's not fair. God knows that. But she's the meanest person I ever met. God, God knows that. God knows it. God sees every bit of that ugliness. So what you've got to do is you've got to let, let it go. I want to tell you something. When you have feelings of revenge that you just carry around, they eat you up. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You can't pray. You can't worship. You can't smile. You can't have fun around other people. Why? Because you're so consumed with this ugly, nasty, I want payback. Man, if you just let it go, number one, you don't go around getting all offended about everything all the time. Somebody says, well, I think you look stupid in that outfit. Well, I don't care. <laughs> if that's the case, then... I won't loan it to you, and you can't wear it, okay? Now, I could be insulted by that. Somebody says, well, that preacher out there, he does this and that, and he teaches this and that. Might be true, might not be. Most of the people that say stuff like that have never talked to me or heard from me. You ever notice that? People that say it the most know it the least. Isn't that amazing? But it doesn't matter. We all work for God. We all follow God and we all trust in God. Let go of that stuff and let God take care of it. And then you don't have to carry it around. You can go to bed and read your book and go to sleep. You don't have to worry about all that. Okay? That's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. That's easy to say. And, of course, I have it perfectly mastered. That's why I'm sharing it with all of you. You better smile. I'll get even with you. I'll, I'll dye that orange vest. Scar scarlet and gray. <laughs> I'll, change, I'll change all your clothes to scarlet and gray. Or what I'll do is I'll come over to your house and I'll take Roundup and I'll spell the word Buckeyes in your front yard. Great big five-foot letters. How about if I just kill you? <laughs> now, you can't get around that one. <laughs> Actually, you could because you're just temporarily in that body anyway, right? Hey, we love you guys. And, and, you know, to me, this is a fantastic passage to look at to really challenge us in how we really live day to day because we live in a very unjust world. And if you think that your job in life is to make everything right, you're going to go crazy. And you're not going to accomplish it. Let God sort the weeds and the crops out. You just keep taking care of the garden and doing the right thing. If you're not a Christian, first thing you got to do is plant the garden. That means you've got to come to the Lord. You've got to give him your heart. You've got to give him your soul. You've got to give him your life. You've got to repent of your past and say, I'm giving it to God. I'm going to follow him the rest of my days. You confess your love for Jesus 
you baptized into Christ, he washes away your sins, and you can start living the Christian life. And it's a challenge. But it's a blessing because you know that God's got you back all the way. If you're not a Christian, you need to do that. We encourage you. If you need prayers for anything, it's what we're here for. We're not here to judge you. You don't have to get our forgiveness, but we'll give you our prayers. Amen? While we stand and sing.